All right, welcome back to this week's edition of the Omni Talk Fast Five. It is June 12th, 2000. Well, June 11th, if you listen to us live, and June 12th, if you're hearing us this on the podcast tomorrow, 2020. We were off last week, took a bit of a hiatus with everything going on, and now we are back, and we hope, as we always say, better than your expectations. I'm joined, as always, of course, by Ann Mazinga. Hey. <laughs> Emma, How's it going? looking festive. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, thumbs up. And Carter, nicely adorned in his typical black sweatshirt and black hat. I had to keep, I I had the, to keep the uniform going. I had to keep the uniform going, Chris, but I appreciate the variance in backwards hat you put on. I think that's great. I did. I'm trying to be my Gary Cooper to you, Carter, as the millennial. That's a very <laughs> yeah. old reference, but for those of you that will listen, will understand why. Um, which is also awesome because you'll see we have some fun things planned for you uh, later oh, in the no. show. For those of you who don't know, this is an incredibly, incredibly bittersweet moment for us here at OmniTalk because this is Carter Jensen's last show with us. Believe I mentioned not, this in a... Car- I was going to say, I mentioned this in a post on LinkedIn, but reminiscing at all of the places where we've recorded the Fast Five, it has been one heck of an adventure over the last three years. I don't know, you know, people might not know the whole story. Chris and Ann and I met in a coffee Mm -hmm. shop now like three years ago, and I claimed I knew how to record a podcast. I think I knew the general gist of it. Uh, The next thing I know, we're in Chris's basement setting up a a pseudo podcast setup uh, on his poker table. And you know what? It worked. And here we are three years later. I mean, how many hundred of episodes? And I mean, look where we've come. It's all good. Yeah, dude. It's amazing to think of where we come from. I think, yeah, you emailed me one day. You're just like, hey, I like what you're doing. We thought about doing a podcast. We met in a coffee shop. We lit the thing up in my basement. Next thing I know, we were buying like drape cloths and <laughs> lights and still using our iPhone and shooting stuff. And then well, we started like finding whatever office space we could throughout downtown Minneapolis and yeah, and then lo and behold, we got our own studio with all our real equipment, and now we can't use it, and we're stuck here at home just trying to make the best of it again. But God, those days helped us prepare for this, that's for sure. That is for sure. Uh, man, but we're going to miss we're gonna miss you. Carter's moving on. Carter's got a corporate gig, uh, and unfortunately, schedules aren't going to allow, I think, this to happen on a regular basis. But we'll see if we can't get him back now and then for different things, and I'm sure he'll be active with us as much as possible on social media, too. But we have got some awesome things planned so stick around if you're on video we have a (laughs) special gift for carter you're watching us live we have a special gift for carter at the end uh that ann has uh created for him uh, along with my help and then we're gonna have some fun you can see emma's got the party hats on we're gonna whoop it up try to raise the roof and of course stick around too because we could not let carter leave without playing our favorite game which is how jet x are you carter <laughs> so stick around perfect, for that. perfect. the it's tables have the turned this show yeah it's awesome now this has been a fun week uh, a lot of interesting stories here i would say these stories are typically a little bit more off the beaten path than what we normally do but that's really because mass line retail has been pretty quiet but we've got some fun stories from zara canada goose roku klarna and what quite possibly could be another canary in the coal mine that is a stitch fix box all right So like I said, stick around, great show planned. And first, a word from our sponsor. So Takeoff. Takeoff is transforming grocery by empowering grocers to thrive online. The key is micro-fulfillment, small robotic fulfillment centers that can be leveraged at a hyper-local scale. Takeoff also offers a robust software suite so grocers can seamlessly integrate the robotic solution into their existing businesses. To learn more, visit takeoff.com. All right. And I set up some big expectations here, Carter, for your last show. Yeah, I, I couldn't. I, I couldn't figure out if there's more pressure on me for the last show, or if it's <laughs> oh, like yes. truly a senior slide where it's like you know I could just change the stories on a whim here. No, Whatever you want, want Carter. <laughs> this is your show. This is your farewell show. You could uh, like no. do this song and dance for forty minutes, and we'd have. To I appreciate listen. those kind words. No, so we're gonna kick things off with kind of I guess a sadder story. Uh, Zara is planning to close twelve hundred stores um, as it looks to really kind of uh, recover from the coronavirus hit. Um, so many know uh, they saw a sixteen uh, percent decline, or sorry, a forty four percent sales slump between February and today's date, uh, which, as you know, really hurt. So uh, they're going to 
to look to close those 1200 stores over the next two years. However, that did not, the news did not come without a but. Um, so the company says it's going to invest a billion more dollars into their e-commerce platforms over the next three years. What I thought was an interesting footnote to that billion was they're also going to send, spend an additional 1.7 billion on upgrading the stores that still exist to be more integrated with their online platform. So I thought that was a really interesting note after this really kind of hard hitting story of 1200 stores being shut down. Obviously, they're not the only retailer that's seeing closures based on the, the hit they've taken from coronavirus. Um, but I think it's gonna be really interesting to see what they do with that $1.7 billion to flip the remaining stores to integrate with this new online platform. Um, it's one of those things where uh, I think it's exciting. However, the story was still pretty vague, right? So um, I would love to know more about what the initiatives are. I think we've all seen and as we've talked over the last few years, we've seen some stores do it really well, really embracing that omni-channel approach, really putting in some of those uh, value add online integrations into their stores, upping the consumer experience. But we've also seen a lot of money just completely be burnt, right? Uh, you know, I won't name any names, but we've seen a lot of innovation, quote unquote, uh, in the physical retail space that has just been for the sake of innovation. Uh, the sizzle, as I've always called it, right? Or the buzz uh, without actually improving the customer experience. So I'm optimistic. I hope that this 1.7 billion in uh, really kind of the reformatting their physical retail, another billion in their e-commerce platform is going to really amplify uh, Zara through this hard time and into the future. So curious what you guys think. Yeah, I mean, Emma, and you guys are like Zara super fans. So I think you guys have to start. And what's your take? I mean, when I first read this headline, I was so sad. I thought, oh, no, we just got Zara in Minneapolis. Now we're going to take it away, but they're not taking it away. I think one important headline like correction here that was incorrectly published in a lot of places is that it's not Zara stores only. It's Inditex, right. the parent company, that's going to be shutting down a lot of the stores. And most of them are in Europe and Asia. They're not going to be in the North America market. So just in case you were worried, Zara is still safe uh, for those of us here in the U.S. But I think um, there's, this is a really good indication of especially where fast fashion is going. You know, the, it's a smart move to start going into a bigger focus on technology. And when you think about it, you just you don't need the three level Forever 21s and H&Ms anymore. There's no need for that. We've, you know, Chris, you have a really great piece coming out in Forbes that I hope you'll talk about um, that really examines this a little bit more closely. But what this pandemic has taught us is that, yeah, the, the retail investment is not going to be, um, doesn't need to be as significant as it once was, especially for these fast, fast fashion retailers, if they're going to stay alive. Totally agree. Emma, what's your, Emma, what do you think? I'm most excited for the investment going into their like e-commerce site because that shopping experience is awful. Like people talk about this on Twitter who aren't retail oriented and there's so much more product on their mm -hmm. e-commerce site than there is in the stores. Mm -hmm. So I'm really excited to see what they can do with that because the shopping experience, you can only look at like two things at a time out of thousands and thousands of products. So I'm most excited about that. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. That's a great point too. It's a great point, especially from, you know, having, you know, trying to shop there and, and bringing that perspective into it. Yeah. And I think, I think, I mean, you said it, I don't know that I have much to add. I do have a piece in Forbes coming out tomorrow. The, the working title is it, of it is, you know, don't expect a recovery at, you know, at best, if you think we're going to get a V shaped recovery in retail, it's really a V it's really a W disguised as a V. Um, that's not really a working title. That was more of a description, but it's something along those lines. So you'll see it tomorrow. <laughs> I'm but hoping that there's going to be some sort of like Mighty Ducks flying V video clip inserted in that. It's oh, the flying V from Mighty Ducks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Social Carter, media. did you see that movie? That's a good I don't idea. know know what that is, but I do ah. know it's a Minnesota reference. So but Carter does, according to Gary Newberry, who's watching us live on LinkedIn, you do have dulcet tones, which I think is a really interesting, a really interesting description of your of your voice and 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 the what is it timber tim what timber of your voice. But anyway, getting back to retail, um, no, I mean I think the point of that piece is like you know yeah you've got the virus, but at the end of the day, physical retail was in was amid a reckoning before all of this happened. And, and like you said, there's just less and less reasons to go to a physical store. You don't need the three levels of a, whatever, you know, specialty apparel concept that it is. You don't necessarily have to go there to get the product you want. And people are now thinking more digitally. We've talked about social commerce and how that is now becoming a new place for discovery. Uh, but that discovery now ha happening online, which in the old world, that never occurred. 
And so I think this is a really smart move. I wish you were seeing more retailers do this as the question of reopening happens because you're basically saying, you know what, now's the time. We know we're not going to have as big of a store base in the future. Let's cut our losses while we can. And let's start to prepare and invest in the things that we do need for the future. And that is a better omni-channel, quote unquote, digital operating platform. I think you're seeing Best Buy take this approach. I think you're seeing companies like Starbucks take this approach. I applaud them all in the article. Um, and yeah, and so I think this is a smart move. Uh, if anything, yeah, I'm actually not saddened by it. Actually, I'm like highly optimistic that I hope more people will start to get the punchline of the joke and follow suit in a similar way. So any other thoughts to add there, guys? Let's do story two, Emma. All right, so Canada Goose is looking to focus on D2C sales through both its own stores and online channel as it begins to pull its line from multi-brand retailers. So some background on Canada Goose. Canada Goose has opened 21 stores globally since 2016 with continued plans for expansion and the products were available for years in multi-brand retailers prior to its own stores. And from this article, the company says it's still planning to maintain some of its wholesale partnerships. So I think this is an awesome move for Canada Goose, just because buying those jackets, that's such an investment and the shopping experience that you get both online and in store, is just something that department stores or multi-brand retailers just don't have the capability of like replicating. So I think it's a great move for Canada Goose. I think it's definitely gonna hurt some department stores going forward, but you gotta do what you gotta do for your brand. Emma, by the way, how much, I, I remember that this morning, how much do you still love your Canada Goose jacket on a scale of one to 10? 12. 12, okay, got it. Emma yeah, is still it. actually wearing her Canada Goose jacket in the summer because she just yes. loves it so much. Paying yeah, off that investment yours. every day. This, this She's story the only one of us that has one. But yeah, it's <laughs> <You're awesome. right. laughs> This story hits close to home, if you guys remember, I think, was it just, yeah. it's so weird to say Black Friday, last year last year as yeah. weird as that it is to say that right now but i mean we had chris you had the video that we did within the cold room there that i think really took off in terms of views people love yep. that firsthand experience we had a great experience that we always have so good that emma even bought a you know fifteen thousand dollar jacket you know and i think that you know it, it this hits home and I, I couldn't agree more you know the comparison i make almost to it is um and I have some Apple blood going through me as a past retail employee That's there, but comparison. you know, but it's like, it's like the Apple store, you know, I never recommend anyone go anywhere else to buy Apple products, even though it's allowed just because the store experience is so dialed and so brand parallel. Um, and, and if you even look, you know, the, the bounds at which target or any Walmart or any retailer can show Apple products is so constricted and so regulated. And that's for a reason. Right. So I think this is a, a really good move um, by, by the brand. And I, I think, um, yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. And what do you think? Yeah, I think it's incredibly smart. I mean, contrary to the last story that we were talking about with Zara, you're talking fast fashion. I mean, Canada Goose, let's be honest, this is a luxury retailer. This is not a $200 North Face jacket that you're fine buying in a Macy's or a Nordstrom or whatever. If you're going to invest that amount of money in this kind of product, you should have an experience that that follows suit. And Canada Goose has always been 100% in, 100% in on experience. They, you know, we talked about a few months ago, they opened their experience only store where you couldn't even buy the product in the store. It was just to try things on and then they deliver within a day. So I think they're still a very accessible brand. Again, I think strategically it makes sense um, going into this next kind of post-COVID economy, um, downsizing retail footprints and really focusing your energy on those few stores that you can truly own as a brand. And they're making triple the profit selling in their own stores versus department stores. So, I mean, to me, it's a no-brainer. Yeah, I love this. I mean, I think we've been kind of saying that this was going to happen for some time. You're seeing the move, you're seeing the move across this, you know, throughout, you're seeing this move across the industry in a lot of ways. I mean, Carter, the Apple example is great. I mean, think about like what Pepsi did like recently, like, right, Pepsi is going direct. That's, that's not any different than what we're talking about here. And so you've got a great product. You've got a great brand in Canada Goose. It's an expensive high-end brand. You want to make sure people are getting the experience that they want to have with that. And now the barriers to entry are such that you can have that direct relationship with your consumer. We've talked about Instagram shopping. We've talked about Facebook shops. We've talked about all those outlets where you can have that direct relationship 
So yeah, your stores are a part of that. How much the average Joe department store plays into that, it just doesn't seem as relevant anymore. And so I think you're going to start to see more companies in general start to go this direction, regardless of whether or not they're luxury or not. The other problem it solves, which we didn't talk about, is it solves the problem of that rogue person going into a marketplace and trying to sell your product as a thing that they consistently do. And that's really hard for these high-end brands, especially to keep a hold of. So the tighter they keep their distribution and say, you know what, I'm only going to do it myself. Then they have a really a much, they have, excuse me, they have a much stronger ability to understand who's not operating by the rules they set. Sure. You're going to get the occasional person. Like say if Emma wants to resell her jacket, one item of her Canada goose jacket. Yeah. But somebody trying to do it in mass as a reseller going rogue, they can't do that anymore if you start taking this approach. So I just think it makes a ton of sense. It looks like we're getting similar types of chatter on LinkedIn Live as well. Carter, anything to add in close? No, I, I, I think you're spot on, Chris. And I think, you know, the, uh, the general term here is, or not even term, but idea is the fact that I, I don't necessarily uh, trust, let's say, a Macy's associate to accurately represent my brand when making such a significant purchase. Um, and I think that you're going to see, again, the trend of some of these brands moving away from that to, to consumer to control that entire experience all the way through. But I mean, you're buying a luxury product. You should be able to have a one-on-one, -on -one, like hands-on experience. It shouldn't be waiting in line at a, you know, checkout counter for people deep to buy a product like that. Like, and if I was Canada Goose, I'd want to own that. Yeah, but I think too, and I push on that too. I think too, I think that's, I think it's also like, I think you could say with any brand, why it's close to what we've talked about before. Why do I need the sales associate at all in a lot of ways? And why do I need the surrounding retail experience necessarily at all of something outside my brand? There's so many different ways to approximate that now, unless there's that role that they're actually playing, maybe in a high end, it's more likely, but like when you start talking about some of the say more mass market appeal items, like you don't need a sales associate to help you buy most of what you're buying on a given time. A jacket, maybe. Canada Goose jacket, maybe. But you know the environment, it's got to be specifically tailored. And like we said, like when you have that cold storage frozen room, it actually really helps you understand totally. what's going on and surrounded by everything else that's happening there. Whereas like you know in the Macy's department next to men's suiting, which Carter frequents so often, <laughs> that's probably it's probably not going to do much for you. So, um, all right, well, let's keep moving. Who's next? All right, I'm up next. Uh, so uh, story number three, Roku taps Kroger to sharpen targeted advertising is the quote from Supermarket News. Uh, I'm curious of the three of you, how many of you have cut your cord? How many of you are still paying Comcast $180 a month for the 300 channels? And I think there might be one. This is a good how millennial. <laughs> yeah, this is good. I we I think I we actually am. asked this 18 months ago. It's it's been asked before, but uh, you'll see there's a reason, reason why. Okay, reason, let's hear it, Chris. My my, my reason's NFL package, but that's still you know that's not gonna be anymore. Not, not gonna, when, gonna be for when, long though. I know when Bezos yeah. owns the NFL, you know soon yeah, enough. I know, right? All right, so you'll you'll see why I asked that. So um, Roku is bolstering its targeting ad capabilities in hopes of luring more brands away from linear TV, uh, which continues to see declining viewership um, as consumers continue to cut the cord. Obviously, not Chris. So um, Roku has enlisted Kroger's Precision Marketing or KPM solution for a new shopper data data program aimed at consumer packaged goods specifically. So moving beyond these stereotypical metrics that us marketers constantly look to like impressions or reach or frequency, uh, Roku said that marketers are now going to be able to activate advertising across the hundreds of ad supported channels. And they're going to be able to link that ad exposure directly to in-store and online sales. Thanks to Kroger. Um, this way we're going to be able to, and I say we as marketers, but uh, marketers will be able to better understand actually uh, what's working. So optimize their ad spend and actually what their return on ad sales is or ad return on ad spend specifically. Um, so this is a difference that KPM is going to provide for Roku. And um, again, it's, it's going to be a, a really kind of revolutionary thing. So um, KPM will join the program as a launch partner to be the first to build in market targeting. Um, and ultimately, we'll continue to see this program grow. So just a couple stats for you, especially Chris, I know that you're not familiar with this world. Um, but Roku <laughs> serves currently 40 million households. Um, and just this last week, it added 30 more ad supported channels to its free streaming service. Um, and in May, it released a new uh, revamped ad pl platform called OneView. So continuing to innovate, continuing to expand. And someday, Chris, you're going to cut that cord and join all of us on the light side. 
I, I think you might be right. I think you might be right. I will say I do love this move. I think this, it definitely shows you where the future is going. So I, I'm not there now, but I definitely see myself getting there at some point. I like this for two reasons. I think one, um, and it's something, I think I've told this story before on the show, but once, once I had the, once, one time I sat down with the CEO of Wayfair and he told me how like the, he never has budgets. Everything is just real time because they run an ad in HGTV. They can see immediately what impact that has on their online business. Now, while all that infrastructure is getting set up in the CPG world, we talk about Pepsi, them doing this through these mediums allows them to make those correlations pretty quickly and they can see exactly what's happening. So it's a really smart investment because you can dial it up or dial it down to whatever extent you want. And I just absolutely love that. And to your point, more people are putting their eyeballs in those places. The other thing I like about this, which I think is different is subtle is there's still an untapped opportunity to me in terms of what is my experience watching something on a streaming service correlated with what's happening simultaneously on my phone and also the networks effects of who else is doing that. So I eat the social commerce angles there too. I don't think anyone's tapped into that yet. And I see that happening because I see myself doing it. I was streaming um, dead to me last night with the Mrs. Ami talk. And I'm always on IMDB, like looking up all kinds of stuff. There's this whole way of engaging with these new mediums that still is being explored. And I think ultimately this taps into all of that too. But Anne, I see you're shaking your head in the affirmative here. Yeah, I mean, you guys covered a lot of it. I mean, Kroger alone has 97% of their transactions, 60 million households that they serve across 2,800 stores and 35 states. That's a hell of a lot of data on top of what Carter was saying. I think it was, what was it, Carter, like 40 million households or something that have the Roku That's stick. correct, yep. Mm -hmm. We just saw in the report that you put out, Chris, this morning from Market Beyond that the like Roku stick is the number four out-of-stock product on Amazon. So I yeah. think that the adoption of this type of over the top, you know, streaming service provider um, partnering with um, a company like Kroger and their precision marketing is going to kind of pave the way for how retailers are doing this, um, you know, how this targeted, especially CPG targeted ads are, are happening um, in the future. Yeah. Emma, are you into this big streaming thing? Like, are you, is that all you're doing now at this point too? I can't even take it seriously with those three words coming out of your head. <laughs> I know, but I was thinking, I'm so Gen Z that I have a TV. It came with my apartment. I don't even know if it does regular TV. I've only ever streamed off of it. And like, that's all I watch. And I'll like put YouTube up there. I genuinely don't even know if I could turn on like the news on the TV. Right, like so if much. there's a quote unquote antenna, if you're old school, <laughs> like, like us. That's, that's, I don't know. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. All right, cool. It seems like we're unanimous on that one. We're pretty much in a pretty much we have agreed on most of the stories today. This is interesting. We'll see if this starts to change a little bit. All right. I feel we'll like that's directed at me. Oh, is it? Yeah, yeah, right. We don't have we don't have you well, usually I'm the contrarian, but yeah, you're the There's still time. There's right still time. Show. Yeah, all right. There's still time. And I think there will be some some points of at least discussion here as we go forward. But all right, I've got story number four, and story number four has to do with Klarna. So if you heard the news this week, Klarna hopes to create what it calls good vibes with its new loyalty program. Program. So according to Chain Store Age, Klarna has a new loyalty program that will provide shoppers with the chance to earn one, quote, vibe point, end quote, for every dollar they spend on installment or financing purchases made via Klarna at any retailer. Can, customers can sign up for the program through the Klarna app free of charge. And then their quote unquote vibes can be unlocked as rewards by way of gift cards at retailers like Starbucks, Sephora, Foot Locker, and Uber. Uh, in addition, Vibe members also have access to exclusive online and offline sales and experiences. And if a retailer has its own loyalty program, customers will also get credit for those programs in addition to what they get credit for at Klarna. I love, 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 love this as well. Why? Cool. I just think it's differentiating. I think it's a smart move. I think we've talked about installment. We've talked about Klarna a lot. We've talked about Sezzle a lot, Affirm a lot. I just, I just think this, this thing continues to happen. I just think it makes sense to pay for your, for your purchases on installments if you can. Why not expend your pay, extend your payables if you can? And this is just a cool way to differentiate and get me you know, into a particular platform, which I haven't heard from any of them yet. Like, oh, okay, now I'll sign up. Because if I can use this, now I can get an added benefit beyond just extending my payable. So I think it makes sense. 
Yeah. Chris, you, you use the word differentiate, and I think the thing, it's accurate to differentiate against like like type services, right? Between mm -hmm. Sezzle or Klarna or whatever the ones we might talk about. But the thing that came to mind for me directly was, I mean, it's just, it's like credit card rewards, right? Like, I mean, you look and say, you know, Amex is doing this all the time. Do I get a Chase Sapphire or a Delta Amex or, you know, cause that Delta Amex one's sure paying off this year, right? But the, the point being is I think it, it went right to um, the credit card rewards. And then I went to how clunky a lot of those reward systems are right? I, you know, yes. I use a Delta Amex because it syncs with my Delta account. And that's like the reason it works. Right. Um, and Apple was in, again, I bring up Apple, but like Apple was looked to be innovative because they finally made their own credit card with, you know, in partnership with MasterCard. And I think it wasn't Barclays, but it was, you know, Goldman Sachs or whatever it was. Um, but the idea is the re there are no fancy rewards. They just like put money back into your account, you know, and it's just as simple as that. And that was a huge value point. So I think you see this added value with new features of benefits. Um, but then you also have to remember, like, what is the user experience behind it? And I think it's interesting. You, t you mentioned, I think it was mentioned in some of the resources that we are, are quoting as here as well. It's not like you have to save up some you know, for some big purchase. It's like you get some money to Starbucks or something that you might use day in and day out. And so I'll be curious to see how seamless that whole thing is. And if it is really something that we go into because of those benefits, because how easy it is that might be able to help me buy my latte tomorrow because I chose Klarna over something else. Yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah, you're right. The digital entry point for this versus like how you sign up for a traditional credit card is really interesting and in how you think about that. I hadn't thought about that before. It's a good point. Also makes me start to wonder as you were talking to like, you know, what becomes our just kind of ubiquitous way of paying and what technologies are involved in that. But Anne, what were we going to say? I don't know. I think, I think you're not as big on this one, huh? You're going to go contrarian. Uh, you know what? I am big on it for one particular retailer and that's Sephora, because I think that if anybody has the power um, to maintain a customer or for a customer to say, Oh no, I'm not going to go to Ulta. I'm going to go to Sephora because I can put my, my, like product on payment plan and I can get double rewards points from Sephora, which Sephora has a huge loyalty base with their Sephora point program. Um, so I think that might incentivize a customer to go to one retailer over another. But I think like to Carter's point, it's only a matter of time before we start seeing all the other installment payment companies doing a similar type of offering. And I, I guess I'd question like how often outside of Delta, I think like the airline point are one thing if you're a business traveler and you're traveling a lot but how often are you like cross-checking your credit card statements and be like oh yeah that restaurant I get double the points at so I'm going to go to that one more often like I don't know I just don't I think it's a good idea it's not a bad thing to have I just don't know that it's like this earth-shattering moment yeah I think I think I'd agree with that too it's, it's just it's differentiating for a time but uh but yeah like everyone will congeal towards the mean here you know as these things continue to go what are you gonna say I was just going to say the other interesting thing too is the partners that they're gift card they're giving gift cards to aren't even Klarna partners. So I wonder if there's like some strategic move mm -hmm. that they're trying to work on here. Like Foot Locker is not a Klarna, at least from what I could see on the Klarna website of all their retailers. Starbucks is not. Hopefully, people aren't putting Starbucks on payment installment plans. But who knows? Um, but those partners aren't working with Klarna currently, so I don't know if that's some sort of like way that they can weave their way in there. So, mm -hmm. yep, Emma, what do you think? Gen Z take on this? You're all about getting money back, right? Paying on installments. I like paying in installments. I'm not really like my credit card is like a college level one, so I sometimes get money put back in, but it has like such a strict limit. And I only have it because, you know, one of those adult things is getting a credit score. So that's really the only like reason I own it. But I I'm do maxed really out like with the Canada Goose jacket. Yeah, right. Yeah, I do really like that. For now, this will like draw me more towards using Klarna over the other installment payment like companies. But like Anne said, I mean, once they all start doing it, I think it all just goes back to the same. I do love paying that way though. I think that is awesome. Yeah. Gets you over the trial hurdle a little bit different too, I think, you know, as we're thinking about this too. Like if you if you've been on the fence of, you know, giving these a shot, maybe you start thinking about how to do this because of this. So all right, and why don't you finish this up here with story number five and then we'll segue into some of the fun things we got planned for Carter on his last day. Sounds good. All right. Story number five is that Stitch Fix has announced that they will be laying off 1,400 of their 5,100 stylists um, that the, are currently in California, so based out of California. They um, will 
uh, do the layoffs in September and those affected will have the opportunity to relocate and um, stay with a San Francisco based company. They just can't work out of San Francisco. So the online retailer said that they will also be hiring another 2000 stylists in lower cost locations like Dallas, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, Minneapolis, and Austin beginning this summer and continuing throughout 2021. I have some opinions on this, uh, but I'll open it to the floor first. Yeah, yeah, Carter, I have a feeling we're gonna mom and dad debate this one, like you like to say here for yeah, one of your final I mean, show or your final show. Just, so why I just do you feel first? a I just feel a little hurt that Minneapolis would be considered a lower cost location. It seems to be <laughs> just really close to home. Ouch. That you know. So I'm gonna let you mom and dad this. I, I'm curious what you guys uh, what you're gonna debate on. I wanna hear what Emma's got to say too though, but like Emma, like current take on stitch fix. I have an interesting short story. We were talking about this in one of my classes and we came to the unanimous decision as a bunch of like 20, 21 year olds that Stitch Fix is for moms. Like none of mm. us had ever used Stitch Fix, but all wow. were like a lot of people's moms were really interested in it. Like moms that, you know, just aren't really into fashion, but want to look better. And so that was kind of an interesting take on Stitch Fix. Now, anytime I think of it, and that's the idea I had in my head too. I was like, this is just for like moms who don't really want to go out and shop. So that's my only tidbit. That's your take. So yeah, so it's like not taking root with you, which which I which is why I asked because I'm I'm really interested in this. Now I'm interested in this for a couple of reasons. Like what if you look, if you think back, remember we did a story probably on the show, I don't know, it's probably two, three months ago now, where Stitch Fix made the decision to start selling its own products. So it went away from just the box. And remember, it's not a subscription per se. You pay like I think the fee is like 20 bucks and you get you get the box on demand and it's you know kitted for you and sent to your house and you keep whatever you want, pay for whatever you want. But like we did a story how they're going to start selling their own products online. And I was, I was worried about this because this showed me potentially that something was up because you're now going to a strategy that not many people have found success with. I mean, you can't count on two hands, the number of retailers that have found success selling their own product lines and apparel um, or selling other people's products, even apparel, even in this case. And so either way, it doesn't really matter. So like it's, it was a dubious strategy to me. It signaled something odd. They had a lot of operational issues in the beginning parts of this year. They're continuing to cite those, it appears, in their earnings release as well. And so then this struck me as a little bit off too, because all along, let's not forget, you've got COVID-19 going on. So you can't go to a physical store. Why aren't your sales doing really well right now? It feels like they should be doing really well. They're not. Oh, and now you're kind of laying off all these people and now you're going to redeploy that. But then I come back to this other point, which is I can remember two, three years ago on stage at shop talk, hearing about how this is a data company and that gets thrown around so much that I get nauseated by it. If you're a data company, why do you need so many people? Like, I just don't get that. And to give you guys a point of context for those listening or watching live 2000 people, that's roughly give or take, how many people I was in charge of when I ran target stores in Northern Colorado, Wyoming, Nebraska, and South Dakota. That's a lot of people. And how many stores was that, Chris? That, like, was, a, that was 12 stores spread across, sure. you know, what for me on an annual basis was 30,000 30, miles checking those out year over year. So like, that's a big operation. Like that's a, that's a ton of people. So if you're a data company, why do you need that? Or what is really going on here? And so it just starts to open. I have no idea what the answers are, but it starts to open up a ton of questions for me about what's really happening at this company. And well, the answer is they don't need it. They don't need it. They built this company based on being this company that, you know, stay at home moms and people that wanted a gig economy type of job could be able to do anytime on their timeline. And I think, my guess is that now that they do have, you know, several years now of collective data coming in, they have algorithms that they already can run that can give you with a good degree of confidence, um, some suggested options for the people, their clients that are still using the Stitch Fix service. Um, Chris, you mentioned they also have other things that they don't even include the stylus on anymore, which are, you know, you can swipe left or right, like the guest app we were talking about a couple of weeks ago. And the service will suggest products for you there. But the, the thing is, and kudos to Modern Retail for really digging into this. Um, one, 
on the call when they fired all of these people in California, they mentioned that this plan had already been in the works for a year. So that tells you that, you know, with a 50% decline in the number of active clients in this last quarter that and other cost cutting measures that they have to take, it's expensive to hire part time employees in San Francisco. And that's another point of note. These are part time employees. These are not full time employees. So when Katrina Lake said in her statement that she's going to be giving benefits, they're going to help people find jobs. That's for full-time employees. That is not for part-time employees, the majority of which these people are. So I want to know who is going to pack up their entire families and lives and move to one of these other states for these 2,000 open positions right now. In What budget do they have to do that without benefits, without anything? So, like there's, so there's no reason for people to be doing this. They're trying to find a way to use PR optics to make this mm -hmm. look like they're not trying to lay off people and move to a more data centric model that's cheaper, runs more efficiently, and, and could arguably serve their customers just as well as having the stylus on, on staff. So that's interesting. So that's your supposition there, that there's kind of more to this. There's a lot of PR and how this is being played out, which may, I think makes kind of my, I mean, that kind of goes along with what I'm saying too. Like, you know, kind of what's, you know, what's, what's really at play. Carter, I got to go to you on this and then maybe we'll close on this. Cause I want your final point of view on this. Cause I think you're good at, I think you're good at spotting BS. Like, is that data thing even an advantage just because you're sending people a subscription box? Like shouldn't an online website be able to understand what their consumer's preferences are just as well as anyone else like so are do they really have that much of a data advantage against anyone oh and by the way like couldn't you in theory based on what we talked about with czar and all that start to capture similar types of data to preferences based on the tools and equipment you give to employees in stores especially if you're deploying so many people what where do you think like are we nuts yeah no, I don't. I, I think I think you're spot on. I think the differentiation there is isn't much, right? I mean, it's just the fact that you have a subscription box and actually sending things to store. You have sure that's great. It's unique. It what makes you different. But I mean, I, you have troves and troves of data from the online platforms and from the digital platforms that you've spent so much money on, you know. And the fact that you can leverage the, I, I think, yeah, you, you are correct in short, right? So, um, and I will agree with you in the negative side of it. It seems like uh, leveraged PR play to have an excuse for laying off a huge amount of really vulnerable employees. Um, and I think that uh, you're seeing that with everything from Uber to a lot of these gig economies where they've figured out a way to uh, not have people involved. Ultimately, the, the weakest, most expensive link in the entire chain. And it's just really unfortunate. And I think that um, they're, they're using this as a way to try to cover up a really sad, from an employee standpoint, story and, and shift. Yeah, it's just hard to know because it's hard to say what's being, you know, what are we selling and what are we buying here in a lot of ways. And I'm going to try to dig into this more and find out more and see what more information we can get as well. But again, just our thoughts on the subject right now. So if anyone wants to send any nasty grams, go ahead. But like, it's just our thoughts. That's it. But I think they're important <laughs> thoughts and we'll see where they go from here. Um, all right. Well, let's close this up. First, we're going to play a game for the podcast audience and we're going to turn the tables on Carter. Oh, great. And we are going to play. I've got the paper right here. Very official. How Gen I, X are you? Yes, this looks really nice, right? Am All I right, aging so out of my millennialism? I don't think I can age out of being a millennial. I think I'm always a millennial, right? I even have a Peloton behind me. Come on, I'm trying my hardest. No, dude, you're always millennial. Yeah, it never All right, cool. Away. All right. No, no, no. It's, it sticks with you like all brand. All right. So... <laughs> First question, question number one. And Ann, jump in here with, if you want to ad lib some questions, do, do whatever you got to do. Um, as, as if, these are, if these are movie related, you guys know I'm going to fail every single one of them. So, so I did one movie let's, related. Let's I started one. with that one. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Name the coming of age tale starring Ben Stiller, Winona Ryder, and Ethan Hawke. <laughs> um, Billy Madison? Oh, great. It's oh. also a great soundtrack, Carter. Maybe great you soundtrack. You might know that. it from that. Yeah. I'm not even going to try. I think anything I say is going to be embarrassing, and I can't leave here on an embarrassing note, so I'm going to say I have zero idea. I'll bet you the Gen Zer knows this one. Emma? No. Oh, my God. Really? Thank you, Emma. Come on. Unified front. All right. Reality I don't really bites. like movies. So. Reality <laughs> bites, Carter. Reality bites. Oh, yeah. I would right. have no Put it idea. on your Spotify playlist. 
All right, on it. Yep. Perfect. Uh, all right, now we're going to move into the CBG and retail categories of the question. Jeez, oh, you're going to realize if, if I'm the real deal or not here. Okay, yeah. let's do it. Yes. Also, also from the mid '90s, what is okay. Olestra? Olestra. Olestra is a uh, a joint and back cream that uh, it's a little <laughs> bit like icy hot, but it's um, 15 years ago. So Olestra is a joint and back cream. I would assume, Chris, you probably use it a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yes, thank origin you. That, of the word. Origin of the word. <laughs> yeah. That's a good. Can guess. I hear it used in a sentence, please? <laughs> and you know what Olestra is, right? Oh God, I'd I'd like to forget it, but yeah, yeah that was it deep. was a, it was. Oh, are you gonna tell him? You probably no. Got you go. You go. You go. <laughs> it was like a. It was a substitute like product used for like flavoring. So you could have potato chips made with Olestra. That's probably it's the most common thing. Basically. A fat substitute. Yeah. So they tasted exactly like Olestra, but they gave you terrible, terrible <laughs> loose stools. Yeah. What, what was it say? It was like on the back of the package. It's like Lay's made with Olestra and in giant warning label <laughs> may cause d wet or loose stools. Yeah, well, there was a term for it too. It was like nothing sells potato chips like a Surgeon General's diarrhea warning. Yeah, it was like gastric leakage or something like that. That was a great <laughs> story with Joe Nairns. It's not fit leakage. for a podcast, but. Uh, so uh, my, yeah. my idea of soothing and loosening is kind of in the right category. Exactly, All right, exactly. Cool. Well, I'm, I'm going to call that close. At heart. Carter. Exactly. Call exactly. that close. Yep, All right. You, I think you're going to, I think you're going to know this one. I tried to give you one, give me a chip shot. So, oh, no. so I got two more. <laughs> what product was introduced in 1985 and was one of the biggest flops in product development history? Uh, can I, is it a technology product? <laughs> no, it's a, it's a CPG product from quite possibly the biggest CPG company in the world. There's a really great oh. SNL skit. Um, is it new Coke? Uh -huh. It is it new is. Coke. I almost spit on my what? water and taking a drink. <laughs> I didn't think you were going to get it. <laughs> All right. Is that I mean, what it is? A... New Coke? That I is... was totally off. What were you thinking it was? I thought that's it was like Crystal the... Pepsi. Crystal Pepsi was later. Not, not was as like Crystal Pepsi was like in the 90s, right? Yeah, or like yeah. late 80s and early 90s. Yep. Yeah. 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 New Coke. Okay. See, like, that's the most like standard marketing 1001. Like, intro case study so i'm glad I, I guessed it was good yeah no that was good that was good you know it's only an important piece of americana and business history but you you passed so that's okay, good right. all right last question this one is probably the hardest question but i think it's also interesting for the listeners there was a store in the 80s called best what was it and what was unique about it i want to google this so bad um we best. actually may have talked about it on the show I I want to hope it's like the 80s version of what Amazon Four Star is, and it's only the best products that the em board of employees uh, picked out and used and stocked within the store. You, my friend, are not far off. Actually, what oh, it was, not bad. Yeah, what it was was almost like something in the style of a department store, smaller scale department store. But what it was was it was a showroom essentially. They sold some products off the shelf, but generally speaking, you went in excuse me, you looked at everything similar to like a Bonobo setup or an Ikea setup and anything you wanted, you asked the sales associate and they brought it out to you from the back. So very similar model to things we have talked about and evangelized here, but just made different through different technologies that we've talked about as well. So yeah, no, you were pretty close with that one. That was pretty good. close. Ahead of their good. time. That was good. All right. So for those listening on the podcast, that was great. Again, it was Carter's last show. We are going to miss oh, him dearly. Man. He's meant a ton of, so much to us, Carter. I, I cannot thank you enough. I know Ann can't either. No, um, there's been a, a lot of awesome late nights, early mornings, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, especially from you two that have been poured in this. And, and the opportunity to be a part of this whole thing has been next to none. And, and I, I can't thank you guys enough. It's been absolutely a, a ton of fun. Um, and, and yeah, it's just been such a great opportunity. I'm excited to continue to, uh, follow along. I'm going to hit subscribe now on uh, Apple Podcasts. So I'll add to the uh, podcast analytics. I won't get that direct anymore, but I, uh, I will add to the numbers and I can't wait to follow along with all the amazing thing you guys do both here on the Fast Five and OmniTalk and Third House and all the amazing things you guys get moving. So uh, thank you. It's been awesome. Yeah, man. We're gonna, it's going to be exciting. Oh, go ahead. Where can man. people still find you though? You'll still be on LinkedIn, right? Oh yeah. I'll still be on LinkedIn posting as always. Yeah. And okay. um, you know, I'm always available. So I, I'm sure I'll, uh, I'll poke and prod and comment plenty on the podcast from here on out. 
But we are going to put a non-compete on Carter for any other <laughs> yeah. podcast. Any other blogging. Perfect. Any other bloggers, yeah, yeah. yeah. But we'll try to have you back as much as we can. And, man, like I said, man, it's been a blast. And yes. so those listening, remember, if you can, uh, keep tabs on Carter. Keep tabs on LinkedIn. Keep tabs on us. Remember to like, review, and subscribe to us wherever you listen to your podcast. Be sure to check out our blog, Omnitalk.blog. Subscribe to us or follow us on LinkedIn, on Omnitalk, our Omnitalk page. And as always, more than ever, be careful out there.